Well, thank you all very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed uh, Flash Gordon, enjoyed your popcorn. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce the director, Mike Hodges, uh, who's going to be with us for a couple of days. Uh, Mike, who, apart from Flash Gordon, uh, has made a number of some of the most important films, maybe in British cinema, including uh, most famously Get Carter, perhaps, in 1971. But Mike began uh, as a documentary maker on World in, World in Action uh, in the television series. He's also made um, Croupier in 1998, I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, 2003. Uh, one of my favourites, Morons from Outer Space, 1985. Excellent. Um, <laughs> Terminal Man, 1974, Pulp, 1972. It's a great pleasure to have Mike with us. Um, I'd like to maybe begin by asking Mike, and I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll quickly get into the, the audience to give you guys as much chance to speak to Mike as possible. Maybe just tell us how given your back catalogue, given your background as a director, how you came to be commissioned to direct Flash Gordon? Well, it's a rather odd story. Uh, Nicholas Rogue was going to direct it initially. And uh, Dino, uh, Dino De Laurentiis, who's the, the last sort of great imp film impresario, uh, decided that if he was going to build all these sets, uh, he wanted to make a sequel. So Nick, who was a friend of mine, suggested I wrote and that he wanted to write a director that I came aboard. So I went to meet Dino and they gave me the script that they were working on at the time. And I realized that I was completely the wrong director. I didn't really know anything about special effects. I didn't know anything about Flash Gordon. I hadn't gone to Saturday morning cinema. I knew little about comics. Uh, so I said, quite frankly, I, I, wanna, I, I really didn't want to make a sequel. So anyway, about three months passed by and Nick and, and Dino fell out. Well, in fact, Dino fell out with his production designer who was an, an Italian aristocrat and who called Dino a pasta maker. So that was the end of his career uh, with Dino anyway. So Nick uh, eventually left. And for reasons that I never really understood, Dino pursued me to, to, to direct the original one. And I still resisted. Um, but I, you know, I needed another film and I eventually, he convinced me that I sh should do it. I turned to my two sons and said, should I do it? And they said, yes, you should do it. So I did it. So that's how I got involved. And what, so once you actually saw the script, how did you, what was your approach to dealing with such strong and I iconic material? Well, the, the, Nick's, the script that Nick and the writer had been working on was very different. It was much more a Nick Rogue film with, with a lot of sex in the skies and God knows what going on anyway. So it was a, it, they were making a totally different film. And I, uh, when I agreed to do it, I, I wanted to go back to the strip cartoon. It was based on a strip cartoon that was set in the 19th, it was started in the 1930s by Alex Raymond. And uh, it, it, I, you know, I wanted to go back to that. In fact, when Dino flew me to New York before I'd agreed to do it, but he flew me over and he, he, I went by Concord. I'd never been on Concord before. And uh, they gave me a bumper fun book of Flash Gordon, right? So I get on Concord and it's full of businessmen. They're all sitting there. <laughs> and the, this bloody plane takes off because it was unbelievable. And, this, and it was like a cigar tube, this, this Concord. Anyway, as soon as we flattened off, we were going along. Everyone took the, opened their briefcase. They took out, took out computer readouts and everything. And I took out my bumper fun book of Flash Gordon. <laughs> And I remember all these people looking at me like I was demented, like I was an overgrown. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I arrived in, in New York and I, I met the production designer, uh, uh, Danilo Donati, who didn't speak any English. Um, and I began to grapple with these two Italians. Dino's English was, was dreadful. And, and I, I was really terrified, to be honest with you, because, they, you know, did Dino unravel these huge drawings? I mean, we're talking about this size, it, uh, this huge block of flats overlooking Central Park. They would block out the light from the windows, you know, and these drawings that Dino, Danilo had done. 
And there was the sort of, there was a motorway in one, and I said to Dino, where's the, where are we going to get the motorway? <laughs> and he had this amazing voice. He smoked six packs of light marble every day, practically. And he had a head like a, like a walnut. And he said, hey, Mike, you know, I, we get, I make Macalpa, I'm going to build it. I said, Macalpa, I'm going to the motorway. Yes, and he said, we get this car, we've got a theatre coming in on this, and they're going to build a car which flies. And everything. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm dealing with someone who's completely irrational as far as I can see. So I, uh, you know, I, 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 I just had to learn how to deal one with Danilo, um, who I loved and was a brilliant designer. He did a lot of Fellini's films, but he was a theatrical designer. He was a theatre designer, basically. And he he would he never looked. It was always a, a set piece. You could really only shoot in one way, like it was in a th in a theatre. And uh, and he'd done, as I said, a lot of Fellini's films. But I, I I then really had to reconcile myself to the fact that I the film was out of my control. I just couldn't couldn't cope with it because D Danilo was off on his own making these sets and the and the, the props which he built, and he was doing all the costumes as well. And I learned how to improvise, basically, because I, uh, there was no way that I could plan it because we couldn't communicate with each other, although we liked each other a lot. Um, so I would just walk in every morning and we would basically improvise and make it up as we went along. I had this wonderful British crew, so I'd say, look, why don't we, you know, when they pull the, blood, the sword out of the aristocrat, why don't we have red, uh, blue blood as opposed to the usual red blood? And, you know, so we made things up all the way along. And, Danilo's costumes, I mean, there's the whole thing with Dale Arden when she's, you know, she's beating up all the pig men. Well, in the script, she did judo chops and threw the guards all over the place. And she came in, she had a metal dress that she could hardly move in, and she had these high heel shoes. So I sort of, I said, well, right, we'll have the shoes off and start, we'll move them as if they were put outside a hotel. So she moves the shoes around. So it gave me an opportunity, really, to, to make up all this, the little details and, you know, the way that the film went. I think part of its charm is the fact that it, it, we didn't really know what the hell we were doing, to be truthful. And, uh, to begin with, I never thought it was either the light of a projector. I just didn't, I just thought we would never make this film. I mean, the skies was another story. Danilo was, was, was crazy about the skies. He had this sort of, uh, sp uh, this Swiss count come in and to paint a sky. And I said, to Dino, you know, Din Dino, what are we going to do with this sky? He said, hey, Mike. He had this favourite line, he always said, Mike, how many films do you make? I said, eight. He said, I make 300. <laughs> <laughs> Every time he'd say this to me, and he'd also if he saw an actress and he's, and he'd, or an actor, and he'd say, hey, I think you, you need to lose three pounds, or I think you need to put three pounds on. I had no idea why it was always three pounds, <laughs> but this was Danilo, Dino, I mean. Anyway, the next thing I had to learn was really how to deal with Dino, because his ego is enormous. So I, what I basically did is I tell him an idea that I wanted to do the following day. So I tell him about five o'clock in the evening. <laughs> I, I think about it. <laughs> so I, we go home. And, you know, I come in the following morning, seventh, and he comes. Mike, I have idea, and he tell me my idea, <laughs> like, and I say, Dino, that you're a genius. This is perfect. Thank you so much. What a great idea. So that's how I began, how I really managed to make the film, frankly. Yeah, I've, I've had vice chancellors like that as well. If you come in and say, say, brilliant idea I've just had, it's the idea you give them the night before. That's, that's how these things work. One of the things that um, is very striking, maybe watching it now in 2019, is how camp it is. Hmm. Was then, when I made it. <laughs> if you met Danilo Donati, you wouldn't know immediately it was going to be camp. <laughs> I had to restrain him sometimes. He had sort of plunging diamante necklines for flash, and I said, D -d 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 -d. <laughs> So I sort of, we compromised and sort of you know, managed to pick a line. But uh, well, the interesting thing that I didn't know anything about Flash Gordon, but I talked to my American friends who similar age to me, and they all said that Flash Gordon, the strip cartoon, had been their sec played all their sexual fantasies about. That, that, that there was a big, big thing for young men in America. So that was another strand to my, my story, really. <laughs> so you were able to make a film which was 
appealing to older people than to just children, and the children wouldn't get the innuendos and all the various, you know, that's element of it, it was just fun. Um, tell me about the cast, because it's such an extraordinary cast there mm. as well, with uh, their ama amazing, ama amazing British cast in it yes. as, as well. What, how, how, how big a role did you play in, in, in ca casting it? Because uh, I like to think of difference between a filmmaker and a director. A film maker makes films and a director directs actors. Um, well, I think the, the filmmaker directs actors as well. How, how would they make the film? I mean, so I, yeah, I, I love casting. I th the film is made in the casting, to be honest with you. Um, and if you make a mistake in when you're casting, you, you could be, you're in serious trouble. So I fight tooth and nail for my casting. When I did Get Carter, you know, I, Michael Caine came on board and I thought that was it. Uh, but no, they wanted, you know, it was MGM had come on board and they wanted, I don't know, all sorts of idiotic people, you know. Uh, they wanted, you know, uh, I, I, uh, Teddy Salavas, I think, was at one point going to be in Get Carter. And I resigned about 20 times when it came to casting. So I thought for... So it really was my, the final card that I conceded was Brit Eklund. Um, so they, that gave them their, another name, but all the rest really were not known in those days. There were, there were theatre actors or television actors, but uh, I, I wouldn't have it because I knew that uh, it's a totally different film to Flash Gordon, patently. <laughs> but uh, in fact, I sometimes wonder if I'm not schizophrenic making the two of them, but there we go. But, th but I think that you know, if I was going to root the Michael Caine character, I had to have unknown faces to the best of my ability. You know. And it's a very funny story because in South Africa, when the film was shown, because of the, the, the content, Brit Eklund was cut out completely. But the billboard said Michael Caine and Brit Eklund. And friends of mine just <laughs> came out and said, where was Brit Eklund? And she wasn't in the film at all. <laughs> so there we go. Mad business. Film might be, I mean. Not let, mm. let, let's, let's, have, let's have some questions from the floor. And we've got a uh, couple of roving mics, so just wait till they come up so we can pick up the sound. Down, there's one, there's one, one down the front here. See if we can get through the labyrinth of chairs. Uh, good evening. I was nine years old when Flash Gordon was first out in 1980. And just to thank you, really, first of all, it was like the most memories of a film I've got is from Flash Gordon. That's right, sorry, I can't. You're when a bit close to the mic. Nine, yeah. I'm not used to talking. See, I, don't like, I was nine years old when the film first came out. So for most of my oh, right. childhood <laughs> memories, yes. it is Flash Gordon. And even now, my mm. girls are 20 and 16. If that comes on the tally, it is the afternoon gone. It is, it's just <laughs> fab. But my question to you is, um, nowadays they're called bloopers, whereby um, an actor forgets a line or something goes wrong in a scene. Were there any scenes when you were filming Flash Gordon that took longer or had to be repeated because somebody forgot the lines or did something or got fits of giggles or anything well, like that? A, um, every film there's, there's some sort of slight mishaps, but not, not, not in particular, no. No. Um, no, I can't really think of any. Sorry to disappoint you. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it even more perfect. It's fine. <laughs> um, Dino is always interrupting. Was he? Yes. Because he, he, when, we, when we watched the rushes, right, in the morning, the crew would laugh because there was a lot of funny scenes in it. And Dino was very puzzled. Mike, why did they laugh? <laughs> so he, he, he really thought Flash Eddie Gordon saved the world. <laughs> he said, and he had the writer who was working with Nick Rowe was coming to London from Los Angeles and he insisted he came into the office at Rodeo Drive and Michael, the writer, said, he wondered why, he said, I'm going to miss my flat. Hey, no, Michael, don't, if, don't ever forget, flashy the Gordon, save the world. <laughs> so Dino was kind of like, a, he was very peasant-like. You know, the, the production designer had called him a pasta maker, and said he was very, very much a, a peasant. And he sort of, he was ch childlike. And I think the two of this got on quite well, because I'm the antithesis. I'm, you know, I did make Get Carter, and it's sort of closer to where I'd probably stand in, in terms of my, the real will that I see. 
Um, so this is the antithesis, and I think we kept each other in check to a degree. But I had to ask the crew not to laugh. And he slowly ran. I mean, when the cartoon was, was originated, you know, we hadn't been on the moon, and I'm now having to start the film with Dr. Zarkov building a rocket ship <laughs> in a greenhouse, <laughs> you know, in, in 1980. So the audience, you couldn't ask the audience to expect it, so it had to be tongue-in-cheek. But then it's, it switches into sort of into the Saturday morning cinema as well. So you have this, you know, this balancing act really between the two of, of, of making, it re making it real for the audience or involved in the audience, but also it was painfully ridiculous, you know. So lots, there's lots of questions now. Who, where's, where's, where's the microphone? God. Hello. Right. Um, I was just wondering. Um, what was your favourite? What were your favourite scenes to film in uh, Flash Gordon and Get Carter? Sorry, what, I what was your favourite scenes to film in Flash Gordon? In Flash Gordon and Get Carter. And Get Carter. Oh Lordy, I don't, I don't, I can't answer honestly a question like that. I'm sorry. I, 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 I can't. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I simply can't because I, you know, it's an integrated piece, and you can't sort of separate a bit of it and sort of say that's my favourite scene, I don't think. Um, I, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I wish I could answer that question, but I, I can't. And I haven't seen it for a few years anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let's get a microphone down, the, down here. It's behind the camera. Great, thank you. Uh, hi. hi. First, thanks for Get Carter. It's my favourite film. All right. And um, how did you get Queen to do the soundtrack for Flash Gordon? How did Queen get involved with Flash yes. Gordon? Yeah. Well, uh, that was actually D Dino's idea. I think he met the Queen's manager or something, because I, I was, when they came to visit the set, and I didn't know they were, I don't think I knew they were coming. Anyway, Pink Floyd was playing over the set. It was when Flash is uh, executed, you know, in the gas sort of chamber. So it was Dark Side of the Moon that was playing when they walked in. Um, but they were, you know, they were much, but they were the perfect choice to, to make the film. And I, I, we got on really well and enjoyed each other very much. But I think it was Dino's idea. I hadn't listened to it. I mean, I'd heard Queen, of course, but I hadn't really. I, I kind of had, I, u I, used, I knew a lot about pop music in the 60s and early 70s, but I'd, I had lost, I'd moved on, really. So I, I mean, I'm very grateful that one that Dino either came up with the idea or that somebody prompted him to come up with the idea, which is more likely. And I'm very grateful they did it because their range is, is just so terrific, I think. And there's a sort of joy about their music, which, which you wouldn't have had with Pink Floyd in a way. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, that's all we need. <laughs> Who are we next? Yep. I've got the microphone. <laughs> Uh, right. So, uh, Mike, thank you. I'm also another person who saw the film when it first came out in 1980, and I'm another big fan of it. Right. But I wanted to ask you, I have read that the uh, working with Sam Jones, he was quite a difficult actor to work with. Yes. And I also read that um, he actually refused to dub uh, no. some of the lines. So I just wanted to know no, what no, the true course, story is. No, what happened was that, I mean... Sam, had, he'd only done a few small roles, really. and he, he, it went to his head, and he got a manager, he got an agent, he got a PR man, he, got a, he went the whole caboodle. And they were, t t you know, they were just taking his money, frankly. Anyway, so he tried to renegotiate with Dino, and you don't, try, you don't do that with Dino. You just don't do it, you know. So he and Dino just fell out, and... I hadn't, we hadn't finished the film. We fin broke, all the main photography had been finished by Christmas in 1979, I suppose. And he, didn't, he wouldn't come back from America to complete. There were just a few shots, uh, which I was evil, very, uh, all wide shots, and I was easy, easily able to use a, 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 a double. But the revoicing, there was some revoicing, inevitably, because there's a lot of fat, fat battles and things like that where the sound effects, just, you know, the actual sounds that you're picking up, the, the human voice would have to be re-recorded. So I got somebody 
to impersonate Sam, just to copy his, his incidences of his voice and so on. So I got someone in and th there were very few lies. I don't know why this story's running, it keeps running and running, I, and it's mad, I, it's so unimportant. But So there were some lines, but he didn't re refuse, he just refused to come back. And it affected the film because with a film like that in America in particular, the, the lead has got to go on the talk shows. And Sam was, you know, Dino and Sam had fallen out, so Sam wasn't available to do the talk show. So I, it did affect the box office in America, I think. You heard it here first. Um, hi. Um, hi. This is my first time actually watching it. I really enjoy it. Um, I was just wondering, what was um, Brian Blessed like on set? Was he um, just as mad as he is today, or...? Oh, he's mad. I mean, <laughs> he wasn't quite as mad as he is now, but he was pretty mad. <laughs> but he's, uh, he's a big boy, big little boy, I mean, really. I mean, he's, and he's a delight to work with, and I, I'm glad I cast him. But Dino, uh, again, he, I, he was a football fan, and my son was playing rugby. So there was England were playing Wales, on the Saturday afternoon. That, and I used to go back to my home in Dorset and watch, I was intending to watch the rugby with my son. And Dino, at half time, with England losing to Wales, that they didn't all the time in those days, the phone rang and it's, the, and it's Dino. And he says, Mike, <laughs> Hawkman, number nine, number 11, right? and which, which shirts, Dino, the red ones. So. So I said, Dino, these are professionals. These are dentists and doctors and architects. They're not going to want to hang on a wire for <laughs> six months while we film it. Hey. So he, uh, you know, but he, he watched the rugby match and decided that the, these bearded men were all going to be Hawkman. <laughs> so uh, that was that. So he, we moved on and we settled for Brian Blessed. I, there were a couple of other beards in it, but um, and Brian has enormous energy. And he brought that energy to, to the film. I'm grateful to him. But he is pretty, he's got even worse now. <laughs> A really great thing. Yeah, just wait. <coughs> Get a microphone up to you. Hello. If I could ask you about Croupier with Clive Owen. Um, yes. It, it's such a mesmerizing performance. Him and Alex Kingston are, are fantastic. So I'm just interested. What are your recollections of making that film? Because it's such a, it's a, I think it's a seminal British crime film. In, in, in what way? Sorry. It, it's just um, the casino in, in compared yes. to say the film casino is so much more realistic in, in tone and feel. So the film itself has a, uh, a realism to me that, say, Casino doesn't? Yes. Well, I, I, yeah, I, there was, it was narrowed down to four actors that when we, I was casting. And I don't normally do a film test, but I, in this case I did, because sh film four were kind of odd about to deal with, I found. So I decided I'd do four tests with actors in tuxedos, <laughs> bow ties, and I get voice, and I use the voiceover. I, so I get them to record, and then you could get the combination of the voice and the face thinking. And the other thing is that when we, when I, and there was only one choice out of the four. They're all good actors, but Clive is patently the one that I, I, was the best, in my opinion. And uh, what I did with, with, you know, with Michael Caine in Pulp, I'd also used the voiceover technique, so to speak. And in the previous television film I made called Room, I also used it. Uh, but this was different. This story was the man himself thinking. So I had him learn the lines, right, the, the, vo the voiceover, so that he would hear the lines, in his own lines in his head, and react accordingly. So that when it gave me fluidity to use the camera, knowing that the voiceover will match and that his reactions will match what the voice is saying. And I think that was... Uh, you know, it's a it's a right idea. Let's put it that way. So is he, you know, that's what makes it so. So I think I agree with you. It's, it's just a mesmerizing performance. I think, but it is. You can see, see, you feel he's saying that, but he's not. He's thinking it. 
And I, you know, it was a, I, a, previously with Michael Caine or in Rumour, I had, the actors just came in and did the lines with the script, you know, into a microphone, and I put them on the film. But this time I played it differently, and I think it was essential in this case for that film. If you haven't seen Croupy, you really, you've really got to. Yes. Oh, sorry, there's one more there. Uh, same, this is the first time I've seen this film. It's great, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, but there was one question that has been going through my head my the entire like time watching it like How were those skies created because it's one of the like most unique practical effects? I've ever seen and I would love to know like how the how, Sorry, how they were created, right? Well, we had when we started the film We had the vaguest idea how to do the skies which were absolutely imperative when I said earlier on I honestly didn't think the film would see the light of a, of a, of a, of a projector because uh, we just didn't know how to solve the problem. D Dino had this, did I say, have I told you this story? He had a count, a, sp a Swiss count come in. Did I tell you this story? Anyway, he had the, the Swiss, he's seen this book of skies, you know, science fiction skies. So he had this count, he was gonna pay 25,000 pounds in cash or something, or dollars probably. Anyway, so come in to, to the studios and he found a little studio from on the outskirts of the studio and the guy actually had a beret and a little pointed beard he looked like a painter anyway so he's in there with his white jacket on and an easel and everything and he we're not allowed to go near him he, he phones out and he says he wants a you know portable radio or a packet of cigarettes or whatever a pasta or whatever it is and three weeks pass by and he rings and he says he's ready dinner to him <laughs> mike he's ready so and Dino, we, we all marched, it was like Mussolini, you know. <laughs> but, but, but Dino deleted the way Danilo with his cap slightly askew and a, and a, a, a scarf round his shoulders and the camp is blowing and me marching on. The, the whole of the Dino's contingent all marching to the little studio. And we go in there, there's a guy with his buried little beard and he's got a, a sheet over the canvas, right? And we all stand there and he goes, and he takes the sheet off and there's a painting of a sky. Ah, it's fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> so I say, yes, okay. so what are we going to do with it, Dino? <laughs> Mike, how many films you make? <laughs> Nine. I make 300. <laughs> so I say, okay, so we take the painting, we, we pan, we shoot it full shot, we pan left, we pan right, and of course you've got a film of a painting. So we didn't know what we were doing. So but the special effects guys started playing around with injecting ink into glycerine in water. And then they shot it at high speed. So it's all these colors mingling started changing color and they you know, changing their shapes and everything. And once I saw these, once I saw those skies and they were offering me lots of different ones, you know, uh, I just knew that we were home and dry, <laughs> we were okay. Um, and it was a great relief, and so the special effects people were able to put them into, you know, I was shooting all the stuff that they were in, in blue backing, and we were just able to slot them in. There was, we, we pushed the special effects, by, as they were very crude in those days, you know, it's not like computerized imagery these days. And, uh, and I'm glad that wasn't, that wasn't, in, it wasn't like that in those days, we couldn't, that wasn't available, you know, computerized imagery. Because I think the film is, it's right to have that kind of <laughs> corny sort of <laughs> you know, backdrop, except the skies are absolutely wonderful, I think. They were so, uh, well one was able to select uh, all these various skies, and so we've resolved the problem, but thank goodness. But it was quite sort of late in the shoot that we started get this stuff started coming through. So I'm grateful to them too, I tell you. Yeah, uh, how did you f first feel when you saw like the whole film as one film, like after it was all made and done directed and everything, how did you feel about the film itself? I can't, sorry, I don't, I uh, don't know. How, how did you feel when you like finally saw the film completed and um, fully together? How did you feel when you saw the final cut? Cut? Yeah. Oh, I was, I mean, I toured around America with the, with the absolute ludicrous, it's the first time I'd ever had it, they were getting audience reactions. And I went to, I don't know, you know, Phoenix, San Diego, Los Angeles, New York, uh, Philadelphia. And we were all flying around, you know, 
running it with audiences and they had people in the in the foyer chiming with stopwatches to see when the kids ran out to get the popcorn how quickly they go back in i mean it was absolutely ridiculous and you could tell from the audience that they were just having a very good, a very good time you know so we then get on the flight there was one dreadful woman who i won't mention her name but she was a big time editor and she wanted to get her hands on this film i have now you know she i don't know why anyway so We'd sit, we seemed to always sit, uh, sit one side of this plane as we were flying along, reading all these cards. And she'd go, hand me one, it said, this film is shit. I, and I said, oh. And I'd say, oh, have a look at that one. He said, this is the best film I've ever seen in my life. And we were swapping these cards. <laughs> and I managed to preserve the film as it was. And she never got her hands on it, but it was, it was uh, laughable, frankly. But there we are. So uh, it, I, I, I knew the film was successful you know the ratings are very high and those uh, on that tour you had a question young lady. and was there one at the back as well there's one, there's one here y yes let, 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 let's start down here there's maybe one at the back mr dicaprio as well later hi um i was just wondering if you could tell me where it was filmed and also how long it took to film Flash How long Golden, it took please. to film? Yeah, and also where it was filmed. Well, the principal photography was 17 weeks. And then they, Dino had a second, a, a second, uh, um, what do they call them? Second unit working on various scenes. And the, he'd done King Kong with him. And unfortunately, he did, it didn't work out on this. So I, I then had to do all the, I was happy to do it. I didn't want to have a second unit. So I did all afterwards, I, I then we did all the Hawk men and various bits and pieces separately. But that took another, I don't know, 10 weeks or whatever but in a hangar. But it was very inexpensive. You know, the big money had been spent on these 17 weeks. And prior to that, I suppose there was six months preparation. But so altogether for me, it's about, I suppose, about two years really. Or less, including the the tour and and I, I went up, the, I made 10 films then and Tina never asked me how many films I made after that. Because <laughs> he knew I'm hitting with 10. <laughs> <laughs> He'd probably gone 301. Hey, mate, 301 I made. <laughs> Bill. Uh, Ed, I know you said you didn't expect the film to see the light of the projector. How the film feels like close to 40 years later, it's still in front of the big blockbusters, and most notably the Guardians of the Galaxy films with the Marvel franchise. I'm sure I'm sorry. Sorry. And this mic seems to be distorting, I'm sorry. Might be the given, given that you didn't think it would ever see the right, light yes. of day. It's me as well. What, what do you think the fact that it's still influencing cinema at the moment? in particular the, the Marvel films and Guardians of the Galaxy? I, I, I don't think so because it's, I mean, it's so different to those. It's, I don't know, I, don't s I haven't seen them, Frank, to be honest with you. So I don't, it's, not because I just, it's not my kind of cinema, <laughs> truthfully. Um, but I, I don't think Flash Gordon, I think Flash is totally on its own, really. I mean, George Lucas wanted to make it originally, I, I'm told. Uh, but, but Dino had the rights, so he couldn't get his hands on it. But I, I, you know, it's such a specific sort of film. I, so I can't, and also I think once you have, uh, you know, co uh, computer generated images, I, I, I think it's, it would have gone away. You know, I th think it would just be so different. It would be so slick, I think, that, that the kind of, um, the kind of madness of, the, of this film. And it would be t too well made, I think, probably. <laughs> You know, so I don't know. I don't think it's influenced. There was a Flesh Gordon, I'm told, but <laughs> 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 which my mo my mother, who lived in Bournemouth, sort of <laughs> she thought she thought it thought it was my film, <laughs> yeah. and she was a Roman and she was a Roman Catholic. <laughs> so I got the holy water thrown over me when I walked in the door. <laughs> Great, any others? Oh, one more, one more, then, I, then I've got a question I need to ask Mike before we close. Hello. Um, as a director, when you first look at a script, um, how do you sort of paint that image in your head? 
to then get it on camera. What's the first sort of thing you think and how do you analyse? Well, I, I mean, with every... It's, with every film, you, as a director, does a, a, a similar job to an actor. When an actor takes on a role, he or she does the research, you know, to the background of the person, and you know, so is it, and then they explore their own experiences and so on and so on. And that's for one character. With the director, you absorb all the characters and all the background and everything that you know that is appertains to the film so is that when you come to shoot it it's it's not impossible it's almost impossible if you've done your job right to screw up because you the film is so ingrained in you you are like the film actually you become the film itself so we get carter for example you know once i I'd sailed in my national services. I was an, an ordinary seaman in the, uh, on a minesweeper. And it, so this was in 1950, something like two or something like that. And I sailed in into North Shields. I'd been all the way up all the fishing ports, which were horrendous in those days. It's um, impossible to describe the horrors and the, the poverty which one witnessed. You know. So I, I remembered North Shields. I'd, I'd gone back up the East Coast because I wanted a set to get Carter which wasn't set by the, uh, on the sea, by the sea. It was set in a, a Midlands town. Uh, but I wanted to find somewhere different. Anyway, so this time I'm coming to North Shields, but I'm coming in by land. I'm not sailing in on a minesweeper. And I see Newcastle, and I see the, the, the bridge and everything. I know that this, is w this will provide Jack Carter, roots for Jack Carter and his psych you know, his psychotic behaviour. You can sort of understand the having been brought up in the kind of poverty that he was brought up in you could sort of at least begin to understand his behavior and then i remembered that that there had been a case you know this is my old world in action days that i remember there'd been a murder there so i started investigating the murder which was happened it was called it was known as the uh the uh oh god what was finney uh, my best film, one of his better films. What was it called? I don't remember. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, it was named after uh, uh, this nightclub where the guy was shot. And the story, it was, it was two years before, and the, per the criminals had been arrested. And the story was a much, like flash, uh, much like Get Carter, in so far as the hitman came up from London. And whilst Michael Caine in, in Get Carter is much more sort of Jacobean tragedy, this nevertheless gave me. It allowed me as a director to be rooted in, in, in Newcastle as it, as it was then, and which had only happened a couple of years before. And, it, uh, and so I, uh, what I'm saying is that you really, you know, you just absorb like a sponge all the elements of the, the milieu, the characters and everything. Um, and you, 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 in a sense, you, you're, you're like a robot then, once you've been programmed, in a way. Uh, so it's difficult to, you know, as I said earlier on with Flash Gordon, once you've got, realised that it was a sort of game, it's going to have to be just played out with, with all the characters, Dino, Danilo, and all the rest of it. Uh, that sort of, you know, pre predicated the way the film was going to turn out. It's a great question. Thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, just if I can close by just asking you, Mike, to s say a little bit about the project you're working on just now. Now? All oh, I see. All, all at sea. Yeah, but uh, the reason Wait. I'm here is that you, is it students from the... Yes. From, from the media studies. Yes. So, so anyway, I'm working with a, a terrific couple of producers in Liverpool f with Hurricane Films, and they made Of Time in the City, which is a lovely film, I thought. And they made other very good films. Anyway, there's an essay that I've written, which is based on, uh, and it's called All It Sees. So it starts, it's library film, mostly. And it starts with, you know, my national service in the Navy and how I learned to just l let go, really. Because I, you know, if you're floating around on a ship for two years, you have absolutely, you know, your destiny is, is out of your hands. And you just you know, you're just at sea all the time. So basically, I learned how to let go. Uh, of any, uh, and I think it's sort of affected me all my life. 
And that, so I've always been able to. I mean, I, you know, by the time I went in to do my national service to the Navy, I was a qualified chartered accountant, which I had no desire to be, but I did it for my parents. And I, so it's this, and then the, the, the agreement was that the students here would can help research the finding of the library film, I think, the main thing. And they get some experience of putting a film together. Uh, and uh, so it's similar to of time in the city, but it's a totally different. There are similarities between me and, and Davis, but, it's, uh, but it's, not, it's a very different sort of film. So that's why I'm here, really. And the deal was that I came tonight and did get Carter tomorrow, which I'm really too happy to do. So It's going to be a big hit. It's going to be a big hit when it's, when it's done. It's <laughs> Make if it never gets made. It's finished. It's finished. And if any of the students are here, thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Um, before we thank Mike for his time today and tomorrow, just remind you a couple of things, as I said at the, said at the beginning. We have 20 tickets uh, for Get Carter tomorrow at the Everyman Cinema in Liverpool. If any students are interested in that, uh, let myself or Roz know at the end, end of the screening. Uh, and if we have any tickets left over after that, we'll let people know by email uh, tomorrow on that. And also, for the students who are interested in taking part in the workshop with Timur beckman Betoff on Friday in the Screen Life uh, project, if you get to work with Timur in making, making your own, own films, uh, let Ros and I know as well. But that's, that's, that's for later. For just now, let's thank Mike for his time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.